So now let's drill down a little bit more. And what I want to uh, illuminate in a little bit more detail are the clinical manifestations that we've talked about, as well as to give you a flavor of the evolution of the symptoms over time. And first, we're going to talk about social, and then language, and then cognitive rigidity, and then sensory. And then we're going to talk about IQ, which is not part of the definition, but IQ has a lot to do with prognosis over time. So one mom said, our child is among us, but not with us. I can't think of a more powerful way to say that. And this table, it is in the PDF. Do not try to copy this down. Even those of you sitting in the front who are trying to copy it, don't. But basically, what I want to point out to you is the column headings. Um, Casey Stengel once said to the Yankees, line up alphabetically by height. Well, of course, you can't do that, right? It's either one or the other. I used to think it was Yogi Berra, but it was Casey Stengel. But what we've got here is two different dimensions, and they're both running in the same direction. Severe, moderate, mild, and youngest, older, and still older. And that's to get the message across that everybody goes in that direction from left to right, and they improve over time. Now, not everybody starts at the far left. Some people, even at their youngest, when they are most severely affected, whatever that is, may start out here or may start out there. But the general progression in terms of the social domain at the severest or the youngest end is to have no eye contact, no physical affection, and the child can't be engaged in imitative tasks at all. And in my reports for kids like this, what I need to write down, because I bring out my little blocks and my shapes and things like that, and I need to say, Johnny was neither compliant nor non-compliant. Rather, Johnny did not understand the expectations of the examiner. You know, we're, we're prisoners of our language. So often, the uh, unguarded might say, he couldn't do X. Well, we don't know that. Or he wouldn't do X. Well, we don't know that either, because wouldn't implies that he knew what I wanted and had decided to not do it, right? So instead, we need to say, he didn't do X. And he did not appear to understand what I was after, because he was neither cooperative on the one hand, nor gleefully oppositional on the other. I know oppositional behavior when I see it. And it's great when I see it. The child goes, hi. At least then I know that he knows what I wanted. Whereas children who simply don't get it are um, incapable of that kind of uh, task refusal. And then you get to kids who have some glimmer of interaction, intermittent eye contact. The parents will say, oh, he gives eye contact or affection on his own terms. If he wants something, he may look up at us. But if we want to get his attention, it's really very hit or miss. It's a one-way street. Or if he wants a hug, he'll run up for a quick hug and then wriggle out of my lap uh, to go off to something else. And at the same time, the child may invade the personal space of others, go up to strangers in the mall, give bear hugs to peers on the playground. Um, and you can occasionally get the child to imitate, although, again, it's like trying to pull in your favorite FM radio station when you're a little too far away. It's kind of hit or miss. And then, in some ways, it's a different kind of a problem. If, if this is tragic, This is poignant, because over here, we have individuals who want to be part of the mix. They want to engage, but they don't know how. So they may come up to you and start with some very formulaic utterance. Hi, my name is Jamie. I like trains. And then the other child answers, and then the child doesn't know what to do next because they've learned a little script, but they don't really know how to improvise jazz music. Um, so good eye contact shows interest in others, often does not know how to join in, easily engaged in imitative activities, but rigid and has difficulty if perceives that rules have been broken and difficulty with theory of mind tasks. So let's 
unpack that a little bit. Again, in the movie Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman's character is walking across the street, and the sign changes from walk to don't walk. Remember? And he stops in the middle of the street. So the sign says, don't walk. The cars are honking at him, but the rule is, don't walk. So he stopped. Very, very rule-oriented, because rules take the place of common sense. Now, I want to show you some examples of theory of mind. Who, this is, anybody know who this is or was? Steve McQueen? Yeah. Great, wonderful actor who died young, unfortunately. Theory of mind. He's in a poker game. So theory of mind is the realization that other people have their own internal mental and emotional state, and then one's ability to try to fathom what's in the other person's mind. So at a poker game, you know, everybody's looking around the table, and you're trying not to show on your face what you're holding, but at the same time, you're scrutinizing everybody else to try to to, to fathom whether they're bluffing or holding aces, right? So I love this picture because it really speaks to the, the process of theory of mind. And what I like when I see it is a child who starts out being totally oblivious to me, doesn't understand what testing means, and then eventually gets to the point where they do something and they look up at me like, did I do that right? That's a milestone when you see that. So theory of mind is the First of all, the realization that other people are not cardboard cutouts, that they're real three-dimensional people, and that they have thoughts and feelings. And then the second half of it is that ability to formulate some inkling. Now, let me give you some examples. So what's happening in this picture? How does the boy feel? Scared. Right. Well, we can see that. We look at his face. Now, Norman Rockwell forgot to put the rungs in the ladder, which is another story. But here's this little boy who's up on a diving board, and he's scared. Well, this is the kind of task that's a theory of mind task. And I have children who can say, oh, it says high dive, 20 feet. But they say, oh, is he happy? Is he sad? Because they can't read the face. Here is a little story. This is the first grade story. Muff. Muff is a little yellow kitten. She drinks milk. She sleeps on a chair. She does not like to get wet. So that's sometimes the way the child on the spectrum might read it. Oh, so I'll say, well, what is this story about? It's about Muff. And then I say, how would Muff feel if you gave her a bath? Clean. All right? He doesn't get it. The child read the story flawlessly but cannot put himself into, I don't want to say the other person's shoes, because except for Puss in Boots, cats don't usually wear shoes. But you get the idea. Here's another story, second grade story. And I'm, I'm putting these up here because we sometimes see kids who come in in fourth grade or fifth grade to rule out a reading disability, you know, dyslexia. But they can read fine. They just can't get the meaning of what they're reading, and they've kind of been off the radar until that point because they have not been disruptive or intrusive. A little black dog ran away from home. He played with two big dogs. It began to rain. He ran under a tree. He wanted to go home, but he did not know the way. He saw a boy he knew. The boy took him home. All right, so what happened in that story? And I take the story back, so the child has to tell it to me from memory. And then I'll say, so does this story have a happy ending or a sad ending? Well, that's not in the story, is it? In order to answer that question, you've really got to put yourself in the dog's position. And one child said, sad because it was raining, or sad because the dog was lost. Doesn't get it. Read it perfectly, doesn't get it. Last one of these. This is a third grade story. And this is the one I like best of all. Camping. Six boys put up a tent by the side of the river. They brought things to eat with them. When the sun went down, they went into the tent to sleep. In the night, a cow came and began to eat grass around the tent. The boys were afraid. They thought it was a bear. All right. So I'll say, is this a sad story, a scary story, or a funny story? Well, the right answer is it's pretty lame humor, but it's supposed to be funny. So this is you know, circa 1940s humor. Well, one child said to me, it's a scary story because the boys were scared. So he can't step out of the story 
and take his identity as the reader as being separate from the boys in the story. Or one of my favorite answers, this from a child with Asperger's syndrome, it was a most unusual story because you don't often find cows in the woods. Okay. But again, if you, if you think about it, elementary school, somebody once said uh, the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. In other words, all the old boy network of the English soldiers that was formed in English public school, what we would call private school, is what really knitted the army together to defeat Napoleon a decade later or two decades later. Uh, the same is true here. A child may do perfectly well sitting at his desk, memorizing the alphabet and reading two grades above grade level and not failing any subjects. But the subjects that he's failing, or she, are restroom, cafeteria, school bus, and playground because those are the places where the child just can't figure out what's going on. For a complete copy of Dr. Connor's paper, go to www.drcopeland.com and click on Related Links.